Now, let's look at the usage of numerical methods in the world of finance. See, whenever we use the word numerical methods, we are referring to a situation where we don't have a formula to compute something. So, we are going with some kind of iterative kind of a method, repeating using some kind of mechanism and trying to converge to a particular solution. So, this particular numerical methods are used in lot of areas in finance and various other, other uh, uh, business areas. So, just to get uh, started, they are generally used, they are a kind of mechanism, they are a kind of iterations, especially when analytical solutions are not available. A closed formula kind of a mechanism does not exist or this formula has some kind of restrictions or assumptions in terms of usage. In those cases, we typically resort to the usage of numerical methods. Probably solving equations. Probably there is a way out to solve the values of the equation. But of course, if that equation forms a 20 degree, I mean 20th degree polynomial, which might have 20 different roots, solving it becomes very difficult. Finding the value, right? Or uh, typically uh, in some kind of optimization problems, we may have to do the same process again and again. A closed form formula does not exist where I just substitute the values and get the output. Solving ordinary equations, if it is just like x squared minus 5x plus 6 equal to 0, I could very well solve for the value of x saying either it is 2 or 3. But there could be a few equations, probably uh, x power 5 minus uh, 20x plus 32x uh, uh, cube minus 20x power 4 plus 15x, sorry, 20x squared plus 15x minus 7. If I want to know what is the, the value of x in this case, it is going to be very, very difficult. So, these kind of equations can be solved quite comfortably using the numerical uh, uh, methods kind of mechanism. We will take one or two examples and try to solve them. In finance, there are lots and lots of applications which use this, especially uh, solving for implied volatility. Or we talk about uh, uh, coming out with a solution for uh, the IRR of a particular uh, uh, investment project, all these things, they can very well be solved using this uh, numerical methods itself. And what we typically uh, see is, Microsoft Excel itself has come out with a tool called Goal Seek, which is explicitly using one of the methods of solving the ordinary equations itself we see that uses a method called bisection method with some modifications in terms of arriving at a solution. Similarly, in some cases, we require optimization methods. Means we are not solving the function f of x to 0, but we are solving in such a way that f of x has to be maximum or minimum. We don't know what is that maximum value or a minimum value, but we want to maximize it or minimize it. Those kind of problems are called optimization problems. And what we see is for those kind of optimization problems, direct explicit formulas will not exist. They are more iterative and repetitive kind of processes. And uh, again, for those also, Microsoft Excel has a built-in package called Solver which addresses those things. Similarly, there could be a few situations where the integrations, definite integral, 
I may not be able to solve them using the integration formulas. Right? Probably a, a normal distribution, the, the function f of x for a standard normal probability density function, 1 by root 2 pi e to the power of minus half x1 squared. Let's say I want to integrate it over a particular interval. I may or may not have, I may have a, a closed form solution or I may not have a formula finding out uh, the integration for it. But if I have to integrate it over a specific range, I can take the help of a numerical method, which means it is more and more of an approximation kind of a solution using the numerical methods rather than directly uh, uh, trying to remember what is the formula in each of these cases. Similarly, when it comes to valuation of options, in the financial world, we know that there is uh, something called Black-Scholes formula, which is more and more appropriate only for those kind of options which are European in nature, where the exercise happens only on one single date. The decision point is one single date and then the volatility is constant. There are so many assumptions that have gone into this specific formula. So this formula kind of an approach is more, uh, more relevant when you are trying to value those kind of options. But today the options world is much, much vaster, vaster that European options form only a small proportion of the total set of options that are there. So all the other options, they can be valued through the finite differences mechanisms, binomial tree models, binomial lattices, which are nothing but the binomial tree models which uh, is one famous model for evaluating uh, the options. There is a finite difference uh, approximation mechanism which is used to value the options. All these are different instances of the numerical methods that are being used. Simulation, how do you simulate the uh, random variables? How do you simulate a particular distribution? How do you simulate values so that a particular distribution is getting adhered to? For various uh, purposes, we use simulation in the world of finance. So what I will do is for each one of them, initially I will explain the concepts behind each one of them. After that, we will take up uh, the numericals that are associated with each one, solving the equations, optimizations. Some of them we have uh, dealt as a part of our uh, other sessions, probably optimization, we keep uh, using as a part of uh, the portfolio management applications. So I will not deal with them uh, separately. Simulations also, wherever we require a correlated set of returns to be generated, we can talk about simulation. Uh, so we will uh, specifically talk about uh, the different numerical methods that are available for solving equations, for doing integrations, finite differences kind of mechanisms. And that would, uh, uh, that would uh, really give you some kind of insight into how the numerical methods are really benefiting the solving of the equations and arriving at the solutions. Right? Now, when I look at the solving equations, the most common method is a bisection method, but an improved method is a newton raphson method. Bisection method always starts with an interval where it needs to start off, x and y. So, initially, it is chosen in such a way that f of x and f of y, they should have opposite sides started in such a way that uh, x and y are chosen, the interval is chosen in such a way that their functions have opposite side. Now, so let's say I have decided that this is the interval. This is x, this is y. Now, we try to find out the value of the function at f of x plus y by 2. Now, this could be, let's say f of x is positive, f of y is negative. Now, what happens if f of 
x plus y by 2 is negative. We say we cut off this interval. We try to choose only this interval for the second iteration. I have to choose at any point, the midpoint of the first iteration will become the interval ending for the second iteration depending on whether it is uh, pay, uh, whether its other pair is positive or negative. It has to be an opposite pair. So if this comes out to be negative, it pairs up with the positive eliminating the other half. So it is always evaluated at the midpoint and only half of the interval will be chosen which will trap the solution. So now it is said that the solution will lie between x and x plus y by 2. The other half is completely ignored. Which gives the opposite sign for f of x at the extremities is the one that is typically chosen. We keep repeating this process again and again until the size of interval comes down, down, down. So x and probably x plus y by 2 will become in a very, very narrow range and I want to stop the iterations there. So our guess is always at the midpoint of the interval and error part is half of the width of the interval. We keep omitting at every stage, half of the width of the interval is directly omitted. So we are trying to narrow down the solution and after a certain number of iterations, we are freezing on our solution. But the only disadvantage, while you can very quickly uh, come down in terms of uh, understanding the solution, what we typically find is the major disadvantage is identifying this x and y where to start because both of them should result in opposite signs to get started as a starting point. But yes, this is a mechanism which can very well be uh, engaged in case the direct solution is not applicable. And bisection method is used as an input in a tool like uh, Excel Goal C to typically uh, come out with a solution. Then, an improvised mechanism is a Newton's Raphson method which simply goes with this kind of iterative approach. You start with some x0 and whatever is the function, you take f of x0. So if I want x1, the first iteration value, I start with x0 and I take f of x0 divided by f dash of x0. The only thing is that function needs to be differentiable. If I am able to differentiate that particular function at that particular value, I am repeating this process until the values are converging. So it's a base, it's a, it's a base of formula kind of iteration. Whatever I have started as an initial guess, it is repeatedly replaced. So initially I will start with this guess. This guess is something that I upgrade with this kind of a mechanism. So this would become, whatever this has come, in the next step, this would become this guess. So now in the second stage, what I'll do is I'll take x1 plus f of x1 divided by f dash of x1. So it keeps happening in this way. Whatever the guess which I started with, it is repeatedly replaced by the f of guess, whatever the value which we have got for some function. And it keeps repeating and at some point it converges, which is what will form the solution for us. And uh, probably uh, uh, on a simpler way, instead of executing this, we'll even take one example and uh, try discussing the newton raphson method as well. So uh, goal seek function of Excel is going to solve these kind of mechanisms wherever the equation solutions are required. Then another place where these uh, numerical methods play a role is during the optimizations process where I am more interested in finding out the maximum and the minimum values of a particular function whereas um, when I have a typical analytical solution when I want the maxima or minima you remember that I take the first derivative of that particular function equate it to zero identify the values of x 
and then after that i take the second derivative of that uh, function if the second derivative is negative i say that at that point there is a maximum if the second derivative is positive at that particular point i say that the function is having a minimum value but that is a typical analytical solution but what we typically see is in majority of the problems the function is not explicitly defined i may not have uh, that kind of direct function which is uh, the for which the derivative can be found out that easily or function may not be explicitly defined as well in those kind of cases i can very well depend on an optimization procedure to find the maximum likelihood estimation for volatility estimations in garsh and uh, ewma kind of models if i have to fit a, a mathematical or statistical distribution to the returns if i have to see whether the returns are following a normal distribution or log normal distribution or johnson sb distribution whatever the kind of distribution i want to go with how do i fit them how do i calibrate the option pricing models we say how do i compute implied volatilities so there are different kinds of places where i may have to rely exclusively on maximization and minimization or related scenarios of building optimal portfolios we have uh, seen in various uh, lectures uh, or on my videos on uh, portfolio management how well solver kind of a tool which uses numerical optimization procedures can really help in generating an optimal portfolio in general the optimization has a very huge base to work on wherever the partial derivatives are there yeah by 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 looking at uh, various mechanisms we can by doing the partial derivatives equating it to zero the maxima and minima functions relating to one variables can be found out in uh, some cases especially in the matrices world i can get into the building of the lagrangians after that uh, once the lagrangian is built i can do the partial derivative of all with respect to all variables form a matrix and then solve the values solver is something which is a tool based solution for solving these kind of optimization problem and when it comes to option valuation a closed form solution model is uh, this binomial shoals for uh, black shoals uh, partial differential equation which talks about the change in value of an option with respect to time with respect to uh, a change in the underlying i multiply it with r times s and uh, the gamma part we are getting into this and finally that should be equal to the value multiplied by the risk free rate of return but we know that this mechanism can be used only when the volatility is constant and only the exercise happens on time t at one single point itself any kind of path dependency present we cannot rely on this kind of closed form formula that is where the binomial tree models and finite difference methods are coming into picture especially when there is some level of discretion with respect to the timing american options they can be exercised any time so wherever we have such kind of uh, timing related uh, discretions we can rely very heavily on binomial tree kind of models but not with this black shoals kind of a formula and at the same time one more mechanism is a finite difference methods we'll take an example of a binomial tree model and uh, go ahead with respect to finite difference methods especially when i have the whole path dependency to be considered right not just the timing dependency especially something like convertible bonds where equity rates change as well as the interest rates change and uncertainty regarding multiple variables coming into picture 
Finite difference methods become more and more appropriate because lattice-based methods can give unreliable results in those cases. All we are doing in this is, wherever the partial derivative I have to take, I am approximating that partial derivatives using the finite difference approximations. And we know, just to give you a brief uh, overview of that, we always talk about f dash of x which is the derivative. We say it is f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Limit h tends to 0. This is the basic uh, definition of the first derivative itself. Now, when I talk about the second derivative, the same logic if I put f dash of x plus h minus f dash of x divided by h. So, it's as good as what is f dash of x plus h. It becomes f of x plus h plus h minus f of x plus h divided by h minus f dash of x is again f of x plus h minus f of x by h. So, overall it is coming out as f of x plus 2h minus 2 times f of x plus h plus f of x divided by h. So, these kind of mechanisms are typically uh, used to identify the derivative with respect to a particular variable. And these differences, which are these approximated kind of values, they are computed and typically uh, used as a substitute to the partial derivatives. So, that is what is the finite difference methods talking about. We will take up an example relating to the finite difference methods as well. And uh, finally, simulation, where the path is, where the payoff is completely path dependent. Let's take one example. Let's say I want to find out the price of an Asian option. What is this price of Asian option? It is the average. I will take an Asian option as maximum of average of ST or S1 to 10 minus a strike price. I may create comma 0. Instead of taking only the S10 which is a 10 day price, I am taking the path dependency average with respect to a particular uh, period and then trying to uh, find out the price dependency. Now, if I know that mu is the return, and some kind of standard deviation associated with the return. Then I can very well find out what should be the return on each of the periods. So let me uh, take one simple example, generate the returns and from there we can go ahead with respect to modeling the prices. Okay, let's look at uh, a scenario where I want to look at the prices. Let's say the current uh, day price is 100, right? The current day price of a particular stock is 100. So, I am maintaining different instances of this 100. Let's say I am taking 500 such instances because I want to repeat the process uh, 500 times to come out with the value of the Asian option. Then I am generating returns and normally distributed returns where the mean, a daily mean is 0.03% and daily standard deviation is going to be 1.5%, right? Daily mean is 0.03% and daily standard deviation is 1.5%. Now, how do I generate those kind of returns? Mu t, the way I generate the return is going as mu t or mu delta t plus sigma 
square root of delta t into an epsilon and this epsilon I'll take it as a standard normal variable where I will try to uh, generate it using a norms inverse function of x. So I'll take it as mu which is 0 0.03 and t anyhow I'm taking it as 1 0 0.03 into t plus sigma. So this is 0 0.03 percent it's not 3 percent on a daily basis I'm talking about 0 0.03 percent plus sigma comes out to 1.5 percent times square root of t is also 1 and here I will take a standard normal variate. So I will take the standard normal inverse function with a random uh, as the probability that is built into it. So I am getting that this is going to be the approximate return on this particular security over the next 20 days. These are going to be the approximate returns which are going to come up on the security over the next 20 days. If that's the case, I want to do the price projection as well. Right? This is, uh, let's say I am taking this for the log normal return or the logarithmic return. So, because this is a logarithmic return, I want to take this number as a part of the computation right from this particular period onwards. I really want to see at what rate or what are the various uh, numbers that are going to come up. So initial period I'll, I'll start off with 100 as well. Right here also I'll go up with uh, 500 instances. Initial period, I will start off with 100 only. But after that, I will take this to be the return. I will take this particular number to be the return. So, I will say S0 into e power this particular number. The number that is coming out for the next period for that particular stock and uh, probably from the next period now if I am coming here it is coming out as S1 into E power something. So across the space now I can repeat this process up to this period 20 and I can recur this process. Right now the recurring of the process is happening now which means after the 20th day these are the possibilities for this particular stock. After the 20th day these are the possibilities for this, uh, uh, for this particular stock. Now I want to design a kind of Asian option which is uh, having a strike price of 100. It has a strike price or exercise price of 100 and which takes the average of the price over the 20 day period, right? The price over the 20 day period is uh, the average versus the 100 is generally taken as the payoff. So, how do I compute the payoff here? I am taking the path dependency in each of the cases. I have taken the average of the price in each of this 500 cases. I have taken the average price in each of the 500 cases. And what is that I am looking at? Based on this average, I am computing the payoff. I am saying the payoff is maximum of this minus 100 comma 0. Now because of this exercise, I have got in some cases there is a payoff that is coming out. In some cases the payoff is not coming out. And this is what will go as 
uh, uh, as the kind of payoff which I am going to get on the day 20. So if you see the average payoff that I am going to get on day 20. Now I will try to see the average payoff that I am going to get. I can simply repeat the process by computing the average. I am getting 1.75. 1 1.79, 1 1.92, 1 1.74, 1 1.86, 1.77. So the average payoff is coming in that particular zone. So what I can very well look at is based on this iteration, I can see what is the kind of average payoff that I am getting on the 20th day. Find the present value of it today and say that that is the price of the option. So any kind of simulation related things can quite comfortably be done using this numer. This is also a kind of numerical methods kind of a mechanism itself. So there are so many uh, typical applications of the numerical methods. Now we'll take up a few numericals which are going to address each of those different kinds of numerical methods looking at uh, how to do the integration using numerical methods, how to do the equation solving, all these kinds of situations. All right. Now let's uh, look at computing the implied volatility of the option using numerical methods. Using different numerical methods, how can I typically compute the implied volatility of the options. Probably we can think of using the bisection method or uh, the Newton's method or finally uh, I can even use the secant method. So all these methods are primarily targeted uh, uh, for solving for uh, variables solving for unknowns using the numerical methods, right? In some cases, uh, uh, non-linear problems uh, could be there, non-linear uh, equations could come out and uh, solving for the uh, unknown x could be a difficulty using the traditional method. So that's where these numerical methods come into picture. And of course, one of the applications in the world of finance using this, uh, uh, which require the solving of nonlinear uh, equations uh, using the numerical methods goes with uh, the implied volatility computation as well. So that's the reason uh, we'll look out this particular computation. So let's make a data entry for the same. A six month at the money call on an underlying asset with a spot price 30. Okay, the spot price is 30 and because it is at the money, the strike price is also 30. Time to maturity is 6 months which is half a year and paying dividends continuously at 1%. So, Q becomes 1%. The worth of the call is directly given 2.5. Assume a risk free rate of return of 3%. Use Newton's method with initial guess 0.5. So, sigma, it is saying initially you take 50% or 0.5 and find the and try to find the updated sigma. Okay, so I know my D1. From here, uh, if I am computing, first of all, my D1, it becomes log S by K plus r minus q plus sigma squared by 2 times t divided by sigma root t divided by sigma times square root of t. So this comes out to be my d1 and from here I get D2 as D1 minus sigma root T 
वन माइनस सिग्मा रूट टी एंड फ्रॉम हियर द एन डी वन आई कैन यूज एनी ऑफ द अप्रोच बट लेट मी डायरेक्टली यूज नॉम एस डिस फंक्शन विच जेनरली यूज सिमसन मेथड सो नॉम एस डिस्ट गिविंग मी दैट एन डी वन इज दिस मच and from here going ahead with the uh, nd2 with the same kind of an approach norm as this comma true giving me that nd2 is this much and from here coming out that the value of the call option is s not e power minus qt e power minus q t into n d1 minus k e power minus r t k e power minus r t multiplied by n d2 so from here it is coming out that the price of the call option is 4.3 so when i am using the initial value of x as 50% the value of the call option is 4.3 but it is already a uh, given that the value of the call is 2.5 the value of the call given is 2.5 so there is a huge error that is still present so that is where i have to revise my estimate of sigma here what is that sigma i should take that is where i'll depend on the newton's method as per the newton's method the next sigma comes if i assume that this is x0 x1 will come out as x0 minus of f of x0 divided by f dash of x0 so f of x0 x0 is 50% percent, 0.5 f of x0 we have already computed 4.3 now this is f of x0 f of x0 is 4.3 or in this case i will uh, i will take 4.3 minus 2.5 so probably i'll call f of x as uh, whatever uh, this has given minus 2.5 i'll be taking as f of x because uh, when we say the equation c is s e per minus q t and d1 minus k e per minus r t and d2 if i have to look at f of x as a solution for uh, solving a uh, uh, for solving for uh, sigma i want that uh, this minus c f s e per minus q t n d 1 minus k e per minus r t n d 2 minus c this expression should be solved to zero what is that particular sigma where this particular expression becomes zero is what is very important to me so that's the reason when i take f of x i'll take it as minus c and when i am looking at f dash of x Yeah, interesting thing. I can uh, very well uh, evaluate f dash of x here, which means uh, here alpha f dash of uh, sorry sigma. Uh, if f dash of sigma is nothing but uh, I'm differentiating this particular equation with respect to sigma, which is nothing but I'm trying to compute the vega of the this particular option because so uh, if I'm trying to differentiate it. it is directly becoming s e per minus q t n dash d1 do d1 by do sigma minus k e power minus r t n dash d2 do d2 by do sigma 
we know from the earlier expression s e power minus q t n dash d1 is same as k e power minus r t n dash d2. So using that particular expression, it becomes x e power minus q t n dash d1. I'm directly taking do d1 by do sigma minus do d2 by do sigma. And we know another relation d2 equal to d1 minus sigma root t. Do d2 by do sigma equal to do d1 by do sigma minus root t. So probably if I want do d1 by do sigma minus do d2 by do sigma, it's nothing but square root of t. So this is becoming s e power minus q t n dash d1 is 1 by root 2 pi e power minus half d1 square. This is n dash d1 and uh, this is square root of t. So what we are getting is f dash of x if I want to find out. I can find it out using this particular expression. All right. 1s into e power minus q t, sorry, into square root of t. So, if I want f dash of x, right, derivative of f of x. So, s into e power minus q t minus q t s into e power minus q t into square root of t right into e power minus half d1 squared e to the power of minus 0.5 times d1 squared. This entire thing divided by square root of 2 pi. So the derivative is coming out to 8.24. So based on that, I will get a revised value which is x1. x1 is nothing but x0 minus f of x divided by f dash of x. So x0 minus f of x divided by f dash of x. So the new modified x1 that I am using is 27.95%. Alright, so if I go ahead now with 27.95%. 95% in the next attempt instead of 50 now if I take 27.95% this is coming out to be my d1, d2, nd1, nd2, c is uh, coming out as 2.48 c is coming out as 2.48 where the actual is 2.5 the same logic I can extend even for derivatives as well. f of x is coming out to this much which is the difference and even the derivative when I am trying to look at there is a small modification because the d1 has changed. So based on this I can compute the value of x2 which could come out as x1, whatever the value of uh, x1 was, this is x1 minus of f of x divided by f dash of x. So this is telling me that why not you look at uh, 228.08 as the value. Now going ahead uh, with the same logic again, I can take this uh, input again to move further, but this time I am taking 
this time I am taking 28.08 as the percentage which is resulting again in ND1 the C value coming closer f of x becoming something like this derivative here so x3 is coming out to 28.08 probably I can take it to with 6 digits the 6 decimal digit accuracy so let me uh, convert it into uh, a 6 decimal digit number So I will look at uh, until I get a 6 digit 2807.56 proper. So I got a 6 decimal digit uh, accuracy in this case. And what I am also seeing is the price of the call option is working out to 2.4999 which is very much closer to 2.5. So within 3 iterations I am able to uh, solve this particular numerical and finally my volatility has worked out to 28.0756%. So that's the way out uh, to solve uh, for unknowns uh, using uh, uh, the Newton method. I, I need to have a function that is differentiable. I'll try to find out the value of the function and then uh, even the derivative of that particular function keep substituting excess by starting with some initial value and then keep improvising on the solution. So within three iterations, I am able to uh, get the value of implied volatility using the Newton's method, right? In this uh, session, I'll be uh, looking at uh, how do we uh, compute the values for the definite integrals using numerical methods. See what could happen is in some cases it is not possible for me to find an integration value by a regular method. Let's say if I want to find out the integration of e to the power of minus x squared probably between some a and b Finding an integration for this kind of a solution is not a straightforward method. So if that is the case, how do I evaluate these kind of integrals? So that is where we are talking of some kind of numerical methods based, especially when there is a definite, definite integral we can use some kind of uh, some kind of numerical methods to typically evaluate the value of these definite integrals if they are simple indefinite integrals there is nothing much that i can do but provided an provided uh, an interval is given the lower bound and upper bound of a definite integral then we can try the usage of numerical methods for doing the solutions for these kind of problems. So this is where I am trying to bring in three major methods. One being the midpoint rule. Then I talk about the trapezoidal rule. And we also talk about another important rule called Simpson's rule. So these are the three important uh, kind of formulas or numerical methods that help us in evaluating these, indefin these definite integrals. So the way they go with the execution of these definite integrals is they try to partition this entire interval. The entire interval, it gets partitioned into some n number of smaller intervals. 
so the higher the interval that i am breaking it into the better is the accuracy that can come out so i am trying to break that interval partition that interval into n number of smaller intervals of equal size which means my each my each interval will have a size which is generally denoted by h which goes as b minus a divided by n so that would be the size of each of the interval which means here this a from a to b they become something like they start with a not which is a then a plus h so the next one will become a plus h then the next one become a plus 2h a plus 3h so in general it becomes a plus ih so for different values of i i being a uh, right from 0 1 to to so on up to n we are having different values of a depending on the interval that we are choosing we are getting the different values of a a not a1 a2 a3 so on and here we also try to use the help of midpoint in these three methods we try to use the help of midpoint which is generally denoted by xi which is nothing but a midpoint between ai minus 1 and ai so ai is generally denoted as a plus ih so it is more like saying if i want x1 so it is nothing but a0 plus a1 by 2 so it's a midpoint between a0 and a1 a0 is nothing but a a1 is nothing but a plus h so when i am saying x1 it is the midpoint like which is a plus h by 2 so these are the common notations that we use and based on these uh, three common notations we generally uh, use the evaluation of the definite integral using any of these three method so first of all first of all we need to have a plan on how many intervals that we are subdividing the 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 main interval of the definite integral then what are uh, the what are the boundaries of each of the sub intervals given by a a plus h a plus 2h and so on and what are the midpoint values corresponding to each of these intervals so that is the kind of a basic information that i would be starting with and using that information we'll try to see how each of these three rules will help me in terms of evaluating this interval so we'll take a very simple example to typically uh, uh, understand this problem so that gives us more and more uh, easier understanding uh, or easier way to really correlate the importance of this so what i say is why don't we evaluate integral between 1 to 3 1 y x plus 1 whole square so this probably we were able to evaluate even through a regular mechanism also because i know the integral of 1 by x plus 1 whole square is nothing but minus 1 by 1 plus x or x plus 1 so this gets evaluated between 3 and 1 so it goes as minus 1 by 4 plus 1 by 2 so probably this should work out somewhere around 1 by 4 but here i want to use those three important rules i so if i am using the midpoint mechanism Well, how do i uh, find out the value of this integral if i am using the trapezoidal rule how do i find out the value of this integral or if i am using the simpson's rule 
how do I find out the value of this integral? So that is what we would try to use so that we can verify it with this answer. So at least while understanding, it's better that we execute it with an existing one so that with a new one, with an existing one, at least I can do the comparison by really finding out the interval integral so that this can be applied even to those kind of uh, definite integrals for which a direct integration is not possible. So, with this, I'll say partition this. So, if I say I want to partition this into 8 partitions, the interval 1 to 3, I want to create n partitions, which means Going by the logic, my h is going to be, my h is going to be 3 minus 1 by 8. So, which is 1 by 4. And a0 is going to be 1. a1 is going to be 1 plus h, which is 1 plus 1 by 4. a2 is going to be 1 plus 2h which is 2 by 4 so which means in general ai is going to be 1 plus i by 4 similarly if i want to find out the midpoint xi xi is going to be ai minus 1 plus ai divided by 2 <coughs> so which is nothing but 1 plus i minus 1 by 4 plus 1 plus i by 4 <coughs> divided by 2. So, I could write it as 1 plus i by 4 minus 1 by 4 plus 1 plus i by 4 divided by 2. So, this is 2. So, it is coming out as 2 or probably uh, in a generic way, it is coming out as 1 plus, if I take 1 by 4 out, it is giving me 1 plus 1 by 4, if I am taking out of these, it is giving me 2i minus 1 by 2, or probably it is coming out as 1 plus 1 by 4 times i minus 1 by 2. So, this is what is coming out as the value of xi. Alright, now let us uh, go ahead in terms of what each of these methods are typically offering for us. So, let us take these things uh, into a spreadsheet. So, we know that n is 8 in this case. And A, which is the initial, which is 1. B, which is the final, which is 3. So, from here, I can find out H, which is the size of each of this interval, which goes as B minus A divided by N. Alright. So, the interval is going to be a 0.25. So, because I have 8 intervals with me, I can start with 0, 1 and I will take it up to 8 because I am going ahead with 8 intervals. So, if I am looking at A0, A1 kind of stuff, so this goes as A0 is going as this particular number plus 0 times h. So, it is coming out that my a0 is 1, a1, a2, a3, so on, up to a8. Similarly, when I am looking at x, x is starting from x1 onwards, which is nothing but the average of the a0 as well as a1. So, these are the values of x that are getting offered. So, these numbers, I am getting them ready. So, 
so that I can solve my numerical quite comfortably. So now, now comes the usage of the midpoint rule. What this midpoint rule says is, you can evaluate the definite integral by simply using this formula h multiplied by the summation from i to 8, i equal to 1 to 8, f of xi. So you first find out xi, you do f of xi in each of the cases. So we, are, we need to know what is our f of x. We have uh, written our f of x as 1 by x plus 1 squared. This is what we have called as f of x. So the midpoint rule simply says find f of xi. So which means if this is uh, x, I can find out f of xi for each of these cases. So I'll do it as 1 by 1 plus sorry, 1 by 1 plus, uh, sorry, x plus 1 squared, right? So, x for me is xi plus 1 squared. So, this is the value that is associated. So, because I am looking at f of xi squared for all xi's, so 1 by x plus 1 squared for all the x size is what I am taking. So this is what is going to come up. And I want to sum up all of them. So this is what is the midpoint rule for me. I am finding out the f of x size the sum of so here it is uh, the sum of f of x size all right this is the sum of f of x size and probably from there i am dividing that by 4 because i have to multiply it with h times h times sum of f of xi. So that is what is going to be this number multiplied by h. So this is telling me that as per the midpoint rule, as per the midpoint rule, the integral, the value of that definite integral is 0.2494. In reality, we have got it as 1 by 4, which is 0.25. <clears throat> so, we are almost close to that number. Probably, instead of using 8 intervals, <clears throat> 8 uh, partitions, if I had done 16 or 32 kind of partitions, I would have come more and more closer to accuracy. So, in short, when I am talking about a midpoint rule, all we do is, First, identify number of intervals, right? So, based on the, uh, here we have identified 8 intervals. Based on that, identify the boundaries of each of the intervals and take the midpoints of each of the intervals. Substitute that value of the midpoint in each of the intervals into the function then add up all of them and multiply that by h. Whatever is the result that is coming out, that is the value of the definite integral as per the midpoint rule. So in this example, the midpoint rule has given us probably a, uh, probably a 0.2494, which is very, very slightly different, 0.25. Minus 0.2494 is to the extent of 0 0.006. So it has evaluated the definite integral to a large extent. So even if I am not able to recollect the, the formula for the integration or the value of the integral, 
uh, uh, I can very well resort to this numerical methods to solve the value of that particular integral using the midpoint. Now, I can very well look at the other mechanism which is the trapezoidal rule. In the trapezoidal rule, all I would be doing is I'll multiply it by, I'll take H. Here, the first and the last, right, I'll take F of A naught, which is the first one, plus F of A8, which is the last one. I take the average of F of A naught plus F of A8. Then, I sum up the re for the remaining 1 to 7. I sum up their F of Ais. So, this is what we will be doing. We are taking the f, the function, with respect to a's only, we are not uh, taking it with respect to uh, the midpoints. So, let's say first, let me find out f of a1 to a8. So, here, we'll try to find out f of ai's only, so that it becomes more explainable to you. So, we will try to find out f of a is right from here. So, it is nothing but 1 divided by x plus 1 whole squared. So, here x is a. x plus 1 whole squared. So, these are my f of a is. Till the last, these are my f of a is. Now, what I am doing is using the trapezoidal rule. Here, if I want to go with trapezoidal rule, first I will take the summation in this way. I will take the average of the first and the last. So, I will take the average of the first and the last. So, these two average I take. And after that, I take the summation of the remaining. I will take the summation of all these and whatever the resultant that is coming, I will multiply that with H. I will multiply that with H, which is what is giving me in this case 0 0.2511. <coughs> so, 0 0.2511 is the value of this definite integral using the trapezoidal method. So, remember in the trapezoidal method, we are not finding the midpoint. We are taking the intervals as it is. We, for each of these uh, intervals, we are trying to compute the value of the function. And uh, except the first and the last. For the first and the last, we take their average. Only half of the first and the last values is what we are taking. Whereas all the remaining values, we take them as it is. And we try to uh, add them up to typically arrive at the value of that definite integral using the trapezoidal kind of a rule method. And now... The third most important rule which we can use for evaluating the value of a definite integral is the Simpson's rule. In the Simpson's rule, all I will do is I will uh, multiply this number with h by 6. What is that I will take? I will take f of a naught, the first value. I will take f of a8 which is the last value and all the middle ones I will take the double of them. The first and the last I will take only one instance whereas uh, all the middle ones I double their values whatever are there and even 
I take the mid values as well. For all the mid values, I take the value of the function four times the value of the function. So I am taking the first and the last. For all the middle values, I take the double of it. And for all the midpoints, I take four times of it. So just evaluating the same here, we have already computed f of x i's and f of uh, a i's. Now here, just to evaluate it out, if I want the Simpson's rule to be applied, all I will take, go by one by one. I'll first take f of a naught. Then I'll take f of a8. Then I will take the double of the sum of all these f of a1 to a7. And I will take 4 times of the summation of all the midpoints. And whatever the result that I have got, I will multiply it by h by 6. So this is my h. I divide it by 6. Working out to almost almost closer to 0.25. This is what is the power of the Simpson's rule. It is almost 0.25 which means we are we are almost uh, away from any kind of an error. All you have to remember is in the Simpson's rule I'll take f of a naught f of a8 for the number of uh, intervals that I have created for the number of intervals I have created, for all the remaining uh, AIs, I'll take uh, I'll take the double of the values. For all the midpoints created, I'll create I'll take four times their value, and finally add up the resultant and multiply the resultant with h by six. So this is uh, a way out to evaluate uh, the definite integrals using the numerical methods. So now, now that uh, we have seen that all these three methods have produced a definite integral whose value is closer to 0.25, now I can very well uh, choose using the same kind of techniques to those definite integrals for which I cannot evaluate the integral quite comfortably. Here it's only substituting the values there is no question of really doing any kind of uh, evaluation or any kind of uh, integration based formulas or rules. So that is, uh, that is one of the prime reasons these kind of techniques can very well be, uh, uh, very well be programmed to typically uh, generate the results for the definite integrals also. Right? All right, so we can uh, very well look at some of the numericals. Uh, now you can try practicing different kinds of uh, uh, definite integrals evaluation using these uh, three different numerical methods. All right. Now I need uh, a fourth order finite difference uh, approximation for f double dash of a in terms of f of a minus 2h and all. So because I want to have a fourth order, I will take uh, up to 5. So I will take it as f of x equal to f of a x minus a times f dash of a plus x minus a whole squared by 2 times f double dash of a plus x minus a whole cube by 6 times the third derivative of a x minus a whole power 4 by 24 times f fourth power of a plus x minus a to the power 5 divided by 120 times f fifth power of a.
now I can look at it with f of a minus 2h so when I go with f of a minus 2h it comes out as f of a plus a minus 2h minus a becomes minus 2h times f dash of a so this becomes a minus 2h is uh, minus 2h squared becomes 4h squared by 2 times f double dash of a and uh, minus 8h cube by 6 times f third derivative of a and so on. Now, similarly, when I am looking at f of a minus h, it becomes f of a minus h times f dash of a plus h squared by 2 times f double dash of a minus h cube by 6 times f triple dash of a and so on. Similarly, if I am going with f of a plus h, it becomes f of a plus h times f dash of a plus h squared by 2 times f double dash of a plus h cube by 6 times f fourth derivative of a and so on. Similarly, f of a plus 2h becomes f of a plus 2h times f dash of a plus 4h squared by 2 times f double dash of a plus 8h cube by 6 times f the triple dash of a and so on. Now when I am simply adding up all of them, f of a minus 2h plus f of a minus h plus f of a plus h plus f of a plus 2h what I am getting is I am getting 4a right I am getting 4a this term is getting knocked off this term is getting knocked off and probably all I am getting is 5 h squared which is 10 h squared by 2 f double dash of a. So this is what is coming out and uh, uh, otherwise uh, here I if I have the f of a term this is what is uh, being uh, worked out minus 2, minus 3 and plus 2. So this is uh, overall giving me 4, uh, 4 times f of a plus this much. So which means I could very well operate out my f double dash of a as f of a minus 2h plus f of a minus h plus f of a plus h plus f of a plus 2h minus 4 times f of a that would be equal to 5h squared times so I can divide it by 5h squared giving me my f double dash of a as h tends to 0 this is what is the fourth order finite difference approximation associated with the associated with f double dash of a because all the f dash of a terms are getting cancelled off through this simple expansion right yeah now our uh, intention is to find out the second order finite difference approximation for f dash of a right so to get this uh, finite difference approximation because I need a second degree finite degree approximation for f dash of a using f of a uh, f of a plus 2h and f of a plus 3h I am more looking at the cubic Taylor approximation because I need the second order 
So I will go for uh, the cubic Taylor approximation of f of x around the point A. So simply put f of x works out as f of A plus x minus A times f dash of A plus x minus A whole squared by 2 times f the second derivative of A plus x minus a whole cube by 3 factorial which is 6 times the third derivative of a and uh, some kind of big O notation for x minus a whole to the power of 4. So here I am looking at x equal to a plus 2h I am putting something and I am also substituting x equal to a plus 3h. So based on this, let's say I want to look at f of a plus 2h. So this becomes f of a plus x minus a. x is a plus 2h minus a which comes 2h times f dash of a plus again a plus 2h minus a again 2h 2h squared which becomes 4h squared let me do it directly 4h squared by 2 times f second derivative of a plus again 8h cube by 6 times the third derivative of a plus some big O notation associated with h to the power 4. Similarly, the same logic I put for f of a plus 3h. It becomes f of a plus 3h times f dash of a plus 9h square by 2 times the second derivative of a plus 27 h cube by 6 times the third derivative of a plus a big O notation of h power 4 as h is tending to 0. So the simple way is I multiply the top equation by 9 and the bottom equation by 4. So 9 times f of a plus 2h because for me I want to uh, I, I, I need to eliminate I need to I, I need to uh, find out the f of so multiplying uh, the first equation by 9 gives me 9 f of a plus 18 h f dash of a plus almost uh, 36 h square by 2 which is 18 h square f second derivative of a plus so on. Similarly, I am looking at uh, 4 times f of a plus 3h gives 4 f of a plus 12h times f dash of a again plus 30, 18h square times f cube the second derivative of a. So overall from here it is going up which means I could very well write 9 f of a plus 2h minus 4 f of a plus 3h is equal to 5 f of a plus 6h f dash of a. So from here I can very well find a 6 uh, so f dash of a works out as 9 times 9 f of a plus 2h minus 4 f of a plus 3h minus 5 f of a divided by 6h. 
as h tends to 0. So I can very well write f dash of a in this case as 9 f of a plus because the other part will become a big O notation of order of h squared. So I can write it as 9 f of a plus 2 h minus 4 f of a plus 3 h minus uh, 5 f of a divided by 6 h. So this is what uh, is a notation of f dash of a in terms of uh, f of a, f of a plus 2 h as well as f of a plus 3 h. Right? Now let me uh, try out how we can uh, compute this uh, Greeks using this finite difference approximation formulas. Right? Different kinds probably finding out delta, theta uh, and even gamma using these finite difference approximations. Once we have the base formula and uh, after that uh, working out uh, with a delta change on that particular uh, formulas getting into the calculations of the deltas, the gammas and the thetas. So for that I will be uh, using one uh, option calculator just uh, to generate uh, the price of uh, the American put and call kind of options for me. So here it's a six month uh, put option, non-dividend paying stock, it's an uh, add the money American put. So can be exercised at any point in time. So the spot price is 45 and because uh, it is uh, an uh, add the money option, even the strike price is 45. The annualized volatility is 25% and the risk-free rate of return is taken as 2% with the dividends. Uh, it's a non-dividend paying stock, so I can take it as 0. So I'll try to find out uh, the price of the American uh, put for this using uh, the calculator so that I can, uh, which can give me up to a good amount of uh, precision so that uh, it can help me for doing the calculations quite comfortably. So inputting these things into this particular calculator, the current stock price is 45. The strike price, number of notes, let me take a very large value, let's say, let me assume some 2000 notes. The strike price being again 45 because uh, we are talking about uh, we are talking about uh, uh, an add the money uh, call option. The interest rate has been provided to us as 2%. The dividend, it's a non-dividend paying stock. The volatility is 25% and it's a six month option. So probably I can enter 182.5 days as the total number of time to expiration. So using that when I do the calculate, I get the price of the American put option, right? So let me take out uh, a spreadsheet wherein I say American put option, the premium that is uh, uh, existing, okay? So uh, initial premium that I have got using the generator is something like this. Let me copy this. I'll simply take it to at least 10 to the power of minus 9. So I'll increase the decimal so that the precision can be understood at any level. So I'm taking it uh, to 10 to the power of minus 9, this being the initial premium. Then, uh, the next thing I would like to work out on the same is the computation of the deltas. So for that I need uh, V of S plus DS. So I'll take different uh, scenarios for DS the change in the stock price, probably I will see what is, uh, if, if I change the stock price by 0 
plus or minus 0.1 what is going to happen similarly plus or minus 0 0.01 so which means I would try to uh, decrease it by one order in all these cases make it 10 to the power of minus 3 4 5 6 7 8 so let's say all these situations I look at uh, the ds so in this case my s plus ds will simply uh, become whatever my uh, stock price is 45 plus this this is going to be my s plus ds similarly I go with s minus ds even that becomes 45 minus uh, this okay so again uh, this is 45 minus 0 0.00001 again these are also with respect to nine digits decimals so let me keep them all with nine digit uh, decimal itself right uh, the same logic probably I can apply for all these as well so these are my s plus ds and s minus ds now I'll try to find out the values from the generator itself I'll try to find out v of s plus ds in each of the cases so using my generator I'll start with the uh, stock price being 45.1 so when I do the stock price as 45.1 this comes out to be my <coughs> American call option price so all these let me uh, make it to nine decimals so this is what I have got when I took it as 45.1 Similarly, I can uh, quickly work out all these things where I can go with 45.01. Okay, so this is the value for 45.01. Then I can try out 45.001. Okay, so this forms the number for 45.001, the value of uh, the American put option, one more zero being provided, all right. one more zero let me see what difference comes out that's the intention of this exercise similarly one more zero Now I see that uh, the call option, the put option premium is approaching, right? Some level of position coming up at different layers. So at least 2.96942, uh, there is some level of consistency at least to those many decimals, though not beyond. Now. I'll stop it here having tried some seven eight uh, different combinations so nine six four two still uh, only up to ten to the power of minus five minus six kind of an accuracy is being worked out similarly I can uh, find out V of s minus ds using this mechanism wherein I'll try 44.9 the downside now I'll try from the downside looking at uh, the premium of uh, the American put option again with a similar kind of decimal points 
I'll take it up to 10 to the power of minus 9. So this time making it with few more 9's being added up. So if the price is 44.99 for a change to that extent, I'm seeing that I'm seeing that uh, the stock, uh, the, the value of the American put option has gone down. If the stock price has gone to 44.99, if the price goes to 44.999, even the put option is a little bit more down. To this extent, and one more nine, let me try out. This time the premium is 2.969, but at the fourth decimal itself, there is a, there is a difference coming out. So the convergence is happening, but uh, at a very uh, 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 now the convergence has come up to four decimals after the decimal point. After the decimal point, up to the four digits, I could see convergence coming up. Now when I have increased it one more nine, still the same, only up to four decimals, four digits after the decimal point, the convergence is coming out even though our three nodes are 2000. And finally, I could very well see that these are my numbers and probably once I go with uh, a change of uh, almost 10 to the power of minus 8 precision, I'm seeing that <coughs> at least up to 6, 7 digits after the decimal point, the values are working out. Right? Now, what I need to find out from this exercise, now that I have uh, computed these things, now I am in a very decent position to find out my delta. In each of the cases, V of S plus DS minus V of S minus DS divided by 2DS. So here I can very well present my delta in all these cases. V of S plus DS minus V of S minus DS divided by twice the DS. So divided by twice the DS. So this is what is my delta in this case minus 0.44 and what we could see is the delta is more or less converging. If I am looking at uh, the 9 digits after the decimal point, at least up to 6 digits after the decimal point, I could see that the delta is converging. So this should be the delta of my put option because this is the number which is uh, slightly getting converged. Probably I should try out even a few more increase in DS to check out uh, even more and approximate appropriate delta for my calculations. All right. So this is how I am getting my delta. The same logic I can use for getting my gamma as well. So the way I get my gamma, V of S plus delta S plus V of S minus delta S minus twice the V of S divided by ds squared. So I'll take V of S plus delta S plus V of S minus delta S minus twice the V of S divided by delta S, which is the ds, ds squared. So gamma is working out to 0 0.006 in each case. Uh, and in almost all the cases, I am able to see that
s plus ds minus twice v of s All right, V of S plus DS minus twice, V of S, V of S minus DS. So here the gamma is coming out to be a quite a heavy kind of a number. So gamma is extremely negative at this particular point. At the more and more it is closing uh, to at the money, the gamma has uh, become more and more of a negative value. The same logic I should <coughs> look at with respect to uh, theta, where I look at t minus dt and uh, keeping all the other things uh, the same, I can very well try working out, assuming again my dt, I'll go with similar kind of uh, calculations, my dt's I'll take as these. So currently my t is 182. Currently my t as a part of the calculator is 182.5 days. So I can do a plus or minus uh, uh, plus or minus uh, those many days to understand the dt, yeah, the theta, right? So if I am taking all these uh, different values, so probably with uh, 182.5, my T minus dt. If I am going with it, I can take as 182.5 minus this. So this is going to work out to something like this. Let me take it again to the nine decimal mechanism. All right. Now, if I start this as t minus delta t, I can use my approximation for theta. V of t minus delta t minus V of t, even I am going with V of t, keeping the t as the original itself. And this is my dt. So if I try finding out v minus dt, I should be able to present this much better. 
right? So I'll find out my V equal to. So this I'll go ahead with 45, the original. Now I'll start going ahead with playing around with T. DT, so T minus DT, I'll take it as 182.4 to start with. So for 182.4, this is my V of T. 182.49 is something that I am taking now which will lead to the price of my American put option as something like this another 9 my put option premium is going to be something like this another 9 This is my put option premium. Another nine goes with this. A one more nine. This is the put option premium. A one more nine. This solution is giving me this as the put option premium. And in this case, this one. So now from here, I can very well find out the theta given this equation, this expression. V of T minus DT minus V of T divided by DT. So I'll take it as V of T minus DT minus V of T divided by DT. So this is giving me my thetas. In all the cases, theta is more or less consistent minus 0 0.007. Theta is more or less consistent uh, across uh, even the delta is more or less consistent. Even here, if you see, if it, uh, with respect to theta, all I could see is if I try plotting the theta as a graph, all I could see is up to a certain extent, up to a certain extent, I am seeing that the theta is more or less flat, but after that, it started growing up. So, which means uh, up to a certain uh, level of precision, I see it is more and more flatter, but uh, the more it is approaching at the money, I could see that the theta is uh, slowly uh, started improving. And that is what we could see at the positions of point uh, 10 to the power of minus 8s and minus 9s. Right? So, this is how we can uh, look at uh, finding out uh, the, the Greeks using the various finite difference based approximation procedures. Alright?